Uh, we're going to try to um, tell some stories. These two are going to talk with each other some if, if need be. Um, I've got some questions here, and um, we're, we're excited. But first, you know, golf starts tomorrow. How many golfers we have in here? Raise your hand. You get on the golf course occasionally. I love being out there. I'm a hacker. I'm an 18 handicap. I've never had a hole in one. If you've ever had a hole in one, please stand up real quick. Hole in one. I missed one Saturday. Yeah. I knew these two. I knew these two were standing up. I want to hear. I, 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 have to tell, I have to tell a story about my first hole in one. Well, that's where I wanted to start tonight. Would you start with your hole in one, and then we'll get to this uh, uh, not so seasoned golfer's hole in one, too, down on the end. What so about you? My first hole in one was a total secret. It was undercover. We play LSU after our bye week. My birthday is October 31st, which is Halloween. We always go to our lake house, and that's our bye week. And then we play LSU the next week. So we were up there. The weather's unseasonably nice for that time of year. And we always have a birthday party, and 12 couples come to the lake that weekend that are good friends. So some of the guys said they wanted to play golf. I said, I haven't played golf since July, but I'll go play with you. So we're on a 230-yard par three. I hit a three wood, and it went in a hole. And there was eight of us playing. I said, look, guys, this is a secret. No pictures, no internet, no nothing. Because if we lose to LSU next week and people find out I was playing golf, <laughs> they'll run me out of Alabama. So nobody ever knew. Um, I have good enough sources that I knew that story the week of, and I never reported it. I don't work for anybody anymore, so it's, uh, it's okay. They know now I kept that under wraps all these years. Uh, now, the guy on the end doesn't play as much golf as you do or as I do or a lot of people in this room. But, Nate, the first time Nate's new to town, I'm playing at Shoal Creek uh, the day after Nate had played. And they're like, oh, your ball is exactly where Nate Oates is it was off the tee. And then he holed it out from there. And I was like, wow, is he a good golfer? And they were like, no, he's a horrible golfer. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have a hole in one. Tell me that story. I don't, I don't want to say I'm I'm shocked. I am a horrible golfer. I still am. So I, whatever, whatever the max handicap is, that's what I put down. I don't, I've never even turned in a score to get a handicap. So <laughs> when I got the job, they asked if I golfed. I said no. I was a high school coach not that long ago. So they, they bought me a set of clubs. Like I didn't even have a set of clubs. So I used them <laughs> twice the first summer. Then when COVID hit, I did a little bit more. And then Craig Byrne told me two weeks before the regions that I was in the regions last year. And they explained to me what it was. And I, I got really nervous because I, I got a slice that's going to, like, kill somebody over there when I tee off over here. So I went to uh, Eric Ushelman. I got some lessons for, like, two weeks. I was probably out there ten days in two weeks so that I didn't kill somebody on the first regions. And I didn't hit anybody the whole regions. That was on a Wednesday. I didn't lose a ball. I didn't hit anybody. I actually contributed one score out of the 18 holes. It was good. So then I had, that was a Wednesday. On Friday, they had to mail more than all, all my practice. I had like 130 yard in North, North River on the 6th. And he played North River. The short little par three over the water. I took a pitching wedge, and it was like 128 yards. And it, it went in somehow. I have no idea. The, the woman, there's a house up here on the right. You know, and you kind of go around, and she can't see who tees off, but she saw it went in. She said, who hit the hole in one? And they're all pointing at me. She looked shocked as can be because the last ball I hit when I played there was in her backyard <laughs> over here. So, look, I, I got it. I haven't got anything close since. So I think there's a lot of luck involved with it. Uh, now, now tonight, we'll, the video will be made available to the 3,600 athletes and their families and fans that are coming to, to, to Birmingham for the World Games. We're 50 days away from the World Games, 3,600 athletes, 100 countries. So we're going to talk a little bit about what these gentlemen can offer them advice on coaching, getting ready for the event. We'll tell some stories over the next few minutes. Um, your two sports are very different when it comes to lead-up time. There's athletes who will see this video that are, have been training for four years for one event. Uh, we'll start with you, Nick, that your SEC championship game, and then you, you have a big gap between a playoff or a bowl game, how do you manage that time with your team to be successful when it's time to get on the field after a long layoff? That's got to be something that, you're, that you have to plan time for and really coach a schedule up. 
Well, I think our situation is a little bit different than the athletes that are training for this event, but uh, maybe some similarities. But when I was a coach at Michigan State, I don't think we ever won a bowl game because my approach was always to bring the season and the bowl game together. So we would practice a couple times a week, every week. So by the time five or six weeks down the road that we played the game, everybody was sick of practicing. We always played horribly and we always got beat. So our sports psychiatrist kept telling me, you got to make this a one game season. Just give the players off, figure out how much time you need to practice leading up to the game, more like a regular week. And the players will have more success that way. So at LSU and here, that's the way we've always done it. And we've had a lot more success. In other words, we don't practice at all. If we play in the SEC championship game, the players lift, we go recruiting. Uh, the strength and conditioning coaches work with them a little bit. And then we say we're going to practice maybe, I don't know, 10 times, 11 times, depending on how, many, how much time we've had off. And we have three days of camp-like practice, and we have a regular week, and we go play the game. And we played a lot better that way. So um, I found out the hard way that, you know, more is not better. You know, less is better. And um, it's worked out great for us. And I would – so my advice would be is look at your competition as a one-game season and lead up to it like it's a one-game season rather than trying to, you know, train your way for four years, you know, into one event. Nate, your, your sport, basketball, it's SEC tournament, it's selection Sunday, and then it seems like you're on a plane immediately going to a first-round game. Uh, you don't have that lead-up time. How do you manage uh, the quick turnaround like that? Because there are some team sports here that will come in, like softball and others, that will, will have to play a game and then scout another opponent and play sometimes later that day or the next day. How do you manage yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot different. Obviously, it's – we put a lot more stress on the staff to get the preparation done with the players. We just tell them not to worry about who we're going to play until we know who we're going to play. You know, selection Sunday comes. I mean, shoot, when we won the SEC tournament last year, we won it on a Sunday and then had to turn around and find out who we're playing a couple hours later and then get on bus and drive up to the bubble in Indy. So, you know, we found out who we're going to play. The staff gets on it right away. And then the players, we just told them to relax. We drove up to Indy. The bubble thing was a lot different. In a normal year, you know, depending on when we lose in the SEC tournament or the MAG tournament when I was at Buffalo, you'd just tell them to relax. Don't worry about really anything. Just recover until we figure out who we're going to play Sunday. As soon as we figure out who we're going to play, we'll shoot out his video as quick as we can to him. They can start looking at video, and then we'll, if we play Friday or Thursday on the first round of the NCAA tournament, you know, depending on when we'll start, we'll do something Monday, a little practice, and then, we tell them not to worry about the second round. Coaches will worry about that. You guys just focus on who we got to beat in the first round, and then we'll get to the second round uh, if we get past the first round. Had a little more success with it last year than we did this year. I think one thing that Coach mentioned that probably most folks don't even think about or understand is we have a lot better technology now uh, to make sure our players do recover properly and that we don't practice too much. A very scientific approach. You know, we have a sports science center. Um, you know, we, we have all these testing mechanisms that test explosive movement, speed of movement. Uh, like, we have a baseline on every one of our players. It used to drive me crazy all the time when we'd go through the season and the coaches would keep saying, the team's tired, we're practicing too long, we're practicing too much, or whatever. And you were trying to do this by sight, you know, just by looking at a guy. And the guy might just be loafing. You know, maybe it didn't feel good that day or whatever. But now we have a baseline on every player. What's their speed? What's their explosive movement? And we have a catapult system, which they have basically a GPS on, on them. And it tells you whether that guy's performing to that level or not. And we post it every day. So every player knows where he's at. We know where he's at relative to his baseline. And if you got a guy like, you know, like Smitty, uh, he would work hard in practice all the time. He was kind of a thin guy. He would start to, to wane a little bit from his baseline, would cut his reps back, he'd bounce back and be ready for the game. And you monitor this in a game too, so you know if the players are ready to play the game properly. So we have a lot of scientific things that we never used to have that really help us be able to manage your roster, manage your team and the games, especially late in the season. One thing you hear these guys talk a lot about is team 
Um, it's a powerful word, team, and you guys are, most of you are very successful business people, and you've got successful companies, and you've built these great teams, um, and not every team is perfect, right? Tell, discuss with me the power of the word team and, and how much you personally love that, that word, team, just being part of a team. Well, the first thing I'll say is there's no I in team. You've always heard that one, right? <laughs> but there is an I in win. <laughs> so, and that stands for the individuals that make the team what it is. <laughs> so, um, but, but I think that, um, to me, winning is all about what's, a, what's important now. All right, how do you get players to focus on being the best that they can be? And I think, you know, p players are much more self-absorbed. Uh, they think about how things impact and affect them. And I think we use that to motivate individuals. But we also try to create a culture on the team where the players understand they not only have a responsibility and accountability to do their job themselves, but they have a responsibility and accountability to the other players that they play with on the team. And in football, you got 11 guys out there all the time, special teams, all kinds of different opportunities for guys to be responsible and accountable. But you have to make players understand that together, everybody will accomplish more. That, that's what makes a team. But you also have to establish principles and values and standards in your organization, and everybody has to buy into those things. Uh, because if everybody does it by end, you're not going to have good team chemistry. You're always going to have a guy looking over his shoulder saying, why didn't this guy have to do the same thing I did? Uh, I think that's really important, but you have to define those things so everybody understands exactly what's expected of them. I think being positive. You know, players with negative attitudes, negative body language, um, you know, they, they, they're, they're energy vampires. You know, they, they kill the people around them. They kill the coaches. So, you know, my approach is players have to have positive energy and attitude when they're together and when they pl practice and when they play. And I always confront guys if they don't. And I always say if you expect everything to go well all the time, you're always going to be disappointed. That's the same thing in life. You know, life is difficult. So if you think everything is going to go great for you every day, you're probably always going to be frustrated and disappointed. If you think there are going to be issues and problems, and you have to overcome adversity, you'll probably be able to stay positive a little better. And that's what we try to get our players to do. We try to get our players to understand everybody's got to be responsible for their own self-determination, which is you've got to do your job. You've got to do it to the standard that we establish in this organization of intangibles, effort, toughness, discipline, to execute and do your job. And then everybody's got to have sort of the work ethic, uh, the resiliency, the perseverance, to overcome adversity, the pride in performance. And some people don't have it. And if you let that coexist on your team, you're never going to have good team chemistry. You've heard me say before, you know, mediocre people don't like high achievers. High achievers don't like mediocre people. If you let them coexist, you're probably not going to have very good team chemistry. So it's important to get the right people on the bus, get the wrong people off the bus, and get everybody in the right seat and then you have a chance to have a good team. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> Nate, you're a high-energy guy, man. I know you love team. You have a smaller group, obviously, and a, long, a lot of games. But how, how much do you love being around the team? No, I mean, that's where you get your energy. I think that's why we get into coaching. You're trying to pull a group of kids together. I was a high school coach for a long time, and you want to really pour into their lives. But just to see them be successful for each other, be happy for each other's success, see them grow up to be young men. And really, I mean, it's hard. Like in basketball, you work, do all this individual training in the gym, shooting, making yourself as good as you can possibly be. But if you can't sublimate yourself to the team, after you make yourself as good as you can be, like all your individual goals aren't going to come about. And it kind of happened this year, to be honest with you. Like, Last year when we had Herb Jones, who worked incredibly hard, you saw how good he was this year in the NBA, worked incredibly hard to put himself in the spot to have a season like he did for us when he was SEC Player of the Year. But then he's the same guy telling me to leave him out of the game when we've got five guys going on a run when he's sitting on the bench. Like So he works harder than anybody in the offseason to develop himself to be the best he can be. And then he's also a good enough team guy 
that when everybody's playing well, he just keeps himself out of the game, tells me to keep them in. So it's hard, though. you got guys that put so much time in to turn themselves into the players they want to be, and they want to showcase themselves as much as they can. But if all you're trying to do is showcase yourself, and we had a little bit of that going on this year, it always backfires. It, it always does. That's just that's what happens. So you got to get guys that want to work hard, be, be in the gym, be gym rats, develop their skill, take their skill up, but then still be all about the team when you come to play the games. And it's it's not easy to do. It helps to have some internal leadership when you've got a kid like Herb Jones and even our grad transfer, Jordan Bruner, and, you know, you get some guys like that that can kind of – your best players or your best leaders, those, those are your best teams because then they can control the locker room and really get the other guys to buy into – being all about the team even after they've worked so hard to make themselves individually uh, as good as they can be. You know, his, his roster is different than, than Nick Saban's roster, the you know, 85, 105 players. I've been lucky enough to become friends with a couple of your former players like Barrett Jones. And I asked him one time, I was like, you know, with that many people, can you have a, 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 like a close relationship with your football coach? You, you've got to coach so many people. And every player that I've become friends with afterwards that you coach, the Corey Reamers of the world and them, they all say that you work hard to develop a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every player. How can you do that with so many players? How do you make that work? Uh, one of the things that I do is um, I have individual meetings with players, you know, quite often. Uh, I always talk to the team. I'm hands-on. I think there's only two things important, you know, when you're in the position we're in is, and we're asked to do a lot of things that can take away from that, and I think you have to really manage your time well. But uh, first of all is how do you bring players to your team? How do you select players to be on your team? And then the next thing is, is how do you develop the players on the team? And I think having the right mindset with players on your team is the most important thing. Well, if you don't have a relationship with them, they don't set goals, uh, they don't understand what they have to do to accomplish the goals that they want to accomplish on the field, off the field, in school, whatever they might be. And if they don't have the ability to self-assess and know how um, they have to edit their behavior to be able to accomplish the goals they have and they don't have the discipline to execute it every day, these are all things that you, you, you're not gonna develop in a player by um, never talking to him, uh, never having a meeting with him, never know what his goals really are, what his aspirations are, how important it is to him to you know, accomplish these things, and does he really understand what he has to do to accomplish them. We assume that everybody wants to be good. I, I don't think that's true. I think everybody wants to survive. Everybody wants to be comfortable. Uh, everybody's not built to win the championship. So you gotta take people from survival average, comfortable, to wanting to be the best that they can be. And I think the best way to do that is to have really good relationships with them. And uh, psychological disposition goes a long way in determining how somebody is going to reach their full potential. I think I'm right about this. Nate, at one point um, in your early coaching career back in high school, did you sell candy <laughs> out of your back, out of your trunk? Is that a true story I heard? I couldn't sell it out of my trunk. I had to teach during the day. I sold it out of my classroom. Okay, you sold yeah. it. I guess you know, it does I wasn't going out to the parking lot between classes. No, yeah. the kids would come to my classroom. We had to, we had to figure out a way to get to They so, had, you know, we tried to develop players. I thought we ended up having 18 kids go play Division One from Romulus, and they hadn't had that much success. So we really just came in there and said, we're going to be the hardest working program in the state of Michigan. Well, they have shooting machines. Like, I don't have 20 managers like I do here. So they have shooting machines where you can get a lot of shots up in a short amount of time. So they had... No shooting machines there, so they cost about, I think they're up to about 7000 now. We've got an off at Alabama, obviously, but as a high school guy, we had zero. So they were like <laughs> five, six grand back then, so I raised 2500 and the Booster Club covered the other 2500 about one, and I bought a second one, and I bought a third one, and then by the time I left, they had six shooting machines. We'd get up at 6 a.m., put the shooting machines up, and we had athletes. We were right outside Detroit, so we figured... If we could develop the athletes into skilled basketball players, we'd be pretty good. So they you can shoot a little bit. You must have been a hell of a candy salesman. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to sell candy to high school kids. Uh, 
I apologize for the trunk part. It did sound seedy, selling it out of the back of your trunk. Um, you and I are the same age. So uh, when I was little, uh, for a little league, we had to sell Krispy Kreme donuts. You're not from Alabama. You're from West Virginia. Did you have to sell anything in youth sports, door-to-door, -door, cookies, donuts, anything to raise money? Where I came from, I don't think anybody could afford to buy anything. So <laughs> <laughs> we just played for, with what we had. <laughs> no, I don't ever remember, you know, doing that. No I, fundraisers? I really don't, don't, no fundraisers. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. Those donuts, uh, I ended up eating more than I sold, as you can tell, and uh, uh, that didn't work out well for me. We, we, we've got so many different sports coming. One of them is uh, flag football that is sponsored actually by the NFL. The commissioner will be here uh, for the flag football competition during the World Games. And I'm interested, um, from the greatest coach of all time, what do you think of flag football? I know you get tired of saying that. They keep writing it for me. Um, the, the, the flag football, what that does for growing the sport, what it does for young men and women playing the sport at that age. Do you like flag football, and what can it do to grow the sport, and, and what do you think the advantages are of it? Well, I think flag football is great, especially for young kids. Um, I've always been a little bit of the opinion that uh, in football, uh, and we're, you know, we've come a long way in terms of injury prevention, concussions, concussion protocols that are safer than what they used to be. You know, football kind of gets singled out when it's not even the sport that um, is number one in concussions. There are other sports that are even more dangerous, I'm going to use that word, uh, when it comes to concussions in football. And I think the most dangerous thing is multiple concussions. So I think if you can start players when they're young in non-contact, playing football, throwing, catching, uh, developing quarterbacks, receivers, skill positions, uh, without contact, uh, I think that's really a good thing. And I think at some point in time, maybe when you're 12, 13, 14 years old, you know, you learn the contact part of the game. I think that's a, a really good way to develop young players because if you're a 10-year-old kid and you weigh 85 pounds or whatever and you get your bell rung one time, you may never want to play football again. Uh, but if you play on a team, flag football team, and you have success uh, and you learn the game a little bit, uh, when you're a little older, a little more physically mature, um, you know, maybe there's a better chance that you'll continue to play. What, what other sports did you play, Nate, growing up? I, I, was a, I was a baseball player, not very good at it. You already heard I'm not a great golfer. I was the kid that got his bell rung when he was little at football and got kicked off the team because I couldn't jump rope. Um, I, I was just not a very good athlete. What other sports did you do? I tried to play most of them, but I... I I didn't play golf or tennis, none of those. I played, I played flag football, though, when I was young. I actually played, I played small college basketball. I went to a D3 school in Wisconsin. I played football in college. I was a receiver. So I played football and basketball in high school and college, and I played baseball as a – I was first team all city, first baseman in fifth grade. And then when the pitches started getting faster and faster and faster <laughs> – by the time I was in ninth grade, I was done with baseball. I couldn't. I hit the baseball about as well as I hit a golf ball. So, <laughs> bats and sticks and balls aren't, aren't my sport. More football the, and basketball. Baseball, football, and basketball for you too, right? Did ever you play all the yeah, sports we, back we, then? We, we played all the sports. Yeah, we played football in football season. We played basketball in basketball season. We played baseball in baseball season. But where I came from, that's all there was to do. We had the river. And we had a swing off of every bridge. <laughs> and then they, they used to take the, the fire trucks out, a volunteer fire department, and we'd have a dance on Saturday night on the cement floor where they parked the fire trucks. So that was it. <laughs> so if you didn't play sports, you didn't have anything to do. <laughs> so um, we, played, we played all the time. And we just didn't play when and organized. We played at the ball field all day long, you know, in the summertime. Um, play roly-poly, hit the bat if we didn't have enough guys to, you know, make a team. Um, play kick the can. When, uh, hot beans and butter. You, you know these games? <laughs> <laughs> Flies and skinners. I remember that one. With grounders and fly balls. Uh, you know, I was – we were the wide world of sports generation. Would you watch that occasionally with Jim McKay back in the day and 
the weird, the weird sports. I mean, sometimes it was the Little League World Series. Sometimes it was the Globetrotters. But sometimes you'd turn it on, it'd be guys in Russia on ice skates jumping barrels. I, I loved watching all those different sports. I loved watching those things, too. But we only got three stations. <laughs> and you had to turn the antenna in the backyard. <laughs> this is the true story to get each one of the stations. You would the have to antenna had to go in a different direction to pick up that particular station. And my dad sort of watched what he wanted to watch, <laughs> and I was the antenna turner. <laughs> I, I was a little bit younger. My, we only had one TV in the house, so we had cable, but nobody wanted to watch basketball every night, so I had a paper out when I was a kid, so I saved up. It was $198 at Walmart, I bought my own TV. I made my dad split the cable, so I got my own cable, and then we sit down and watch shoot that ACC Big East Monday. I watch basketball every night of the week. So if my mom wanted to hang out with me, she came down to the basement where my room was and watched basketball with me. So that's I was a little bit younger. We didn't have to turn the uh, we had, we had cable when I grew up. But it's, <laughs> uh, so we've learned a lot about Nate tonight. He uh, sold candy out of his trunk. I mean his desk. And uh, you stole cable by splitting the cable wires from the, steal it. From the local it cable the house. I didn't steal my neighbors. <laughs> we split it within the house, you know. Uh, hey, we, we're so excited about the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies uh, for these world games in 50 days. The closing ceremonies with stars like Randy Owens, the Supergroup Alabama, members of the Rolling Stone, and Lionel Richie will be there. Um, you talked about dancing. I, you, I assumed you learned to dance very well very early in life. You, you have a love for music, don't you? You, you like music? Yeah, absolutely. I, I met Chuck Lavelle at, in Tuscaloosa. Um, you know, people don't believe this, but when the Rolling Stones were in Atlanta, I was there. <laughs> 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 I hide, I come in when the lights go down and they start start me up, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> in the shadows. Um, you know, I go to see the Eagles all the time, listen to music all the time on my boat in the car. Um, it's uh, very relaxing, but you know the one thing for all you youngins out there is Jim and I may be of the same age, vintage, whatever you want to call it, but we actually experience the best music of all time in our lifetime. From Elvis Presley to the, to the Beatles, to the Rolling Stones, to Motown, I mean, just think of all that, then light rock with the Eagles and all that. I mean, I signed autographs today for a bunch of young guys. And they said, is it okay if we play music? I said, sure, play your music. They were playing music from when I was in college. Oh, you see? There you go. I mean. So, Nate, what about your Backstreet Boys or whatever it was you listened to? <laughs> boys, to boys to men. <laughs> Boys to men. Uh, that's fantastic. I spent 11 years in Detroit, so we got a little Motown. <laughs> um, but, okay, when I was in college and I was a C student, I would have music on while I was studying. You don't listen to music when you're watching game tape, though. Is it just your focus on tape, or do you have music playing for either one of you when you're watching, watching tape? I, I don't. Um, I tried it. I just, I don't know. You know, I'm writing, I'm looking, I'm thinking, um, wasn't, you know, music to me is something you do and you listen to when you want to relax and you're not really, your mind's not on anything else. Nate, do you listen to music when you watch game tape? No, no, that's the only, the only music I listen to when I do is like, I like to read and you just put some like music with no words on. Other than that, I'm listening when I'm in the car or on a boat or now, something I, I like know that. I know us media people occasionally ask really dumb questions, but, you know, I picture... Occasionally? You, occasionally, yes. <laughs> Usually when we have a microphone. Um, you know, my philosophy on answering your questions is I never answer your questions. Yeah. Because you story. really don't know what to ask. Yeah. All right, so, but you do need us to talk. So right. I just talk about whatever I want to talk about, and you're all satisfied with that. I had a chance to host his show uh, for a few years, and in 2008, the first one, uh, we were at the Mercedes, it, wasn't, it was Georgia Dome then, I think, it wasn't even Mercedes-Benz Stadium, um, and afterwards, um, my wife, 
of 23 years now. She's, she's a pastor uh, now. She wasn't then. I've driven her to become a pastor. Um, and she was like, so how did it go? Were you nervous? I said, oh, I was so nervous. I was sweating and, you know, just I'm overweight at the time, still a little overweight, but was more overweight then. Just, I don't know. I, I really don't remember, you know, me asking questions and him answering it. And then I went back and watched the first show, and you're exactly right. I asked a question, and you answered something that had nothing to do with the question. But it was a better show that way. It was the Nick Saban show. It had nothing to do with me. It worked out really good. You guys are lucky now. You've got the great Chris Stewart. I mean, that, that guy's the best. So big round of applause for Chris Stewart, yeah. who is one of the best men in the world. Um, so as we, we get ready to start winding things down here, I want to I talk about discipline a little bit. Um, because it's easy when you're, when you're sitting at home and you see on the ticker that somebody's gotten in trouble for this, and you instantly think, you know, if it's the star player for the other team, he should be suspended for the year. And if it's a star player for your team, you, you, as a fan, you're sitting there, oh, I hope he doesn't miss the next game. How do you guys handle discipline? But I want to start it off by saying, when was the last time when you were little that you were disciplined by mom and dad? My grandmother, who raised me, I was, lived with her, was a ship welder. She welded ships during World War II. And she was a lover, but my nanny would make me actually go out and get my own switch and bring it back in. Um, she would rarely hit me with it, but the process of going to get the switch was a lesson. What did you do the last time, I'll start with you, Nick, the last time you got disciplined by mom or dad? Or Terry? Well, but, <laughs> well, first of all, typical media. <laughs> You're assuming that discipline is punishment. Right, right. right which is what you all think. As so, soon as somebody does something wrong, what are you going to do to them? That's not really true. My mom kept a switch on the refrigerator, and she just said, if you do that again, I'm getting a switch out. So that ended that. I learned cause and effect, which some people don't ever really learn. I think there has to be something. If you're going to take something away from somebody, it should change their behavior. That's not discipline. That's just a form of punishment to change somebody's behavior. But look... I never, I could tell you one story where I got a spank, and I remember that. There was a hobo that used to walk the railroad track. This is a true story at my dad's service station. And he would come at 7 o'clock in the morning. The guy was always drunk. And um, my dad would give him coffee and cheese crackers. And I was in the first bay changing tires. And, you know, where I grew up, the last guy out of town turned the lights out when we played a game. Everybody went to the game. The school was a social center. The community it was a small town. We always had good teams. But everybody went to the game. So even the hobo was at the game. So I don't know if we, lo I don't know if we lost or I played bad or what. But the hobo's given me a bunch of stuff about the game. And I told him in the kindest way I knew to kiss off. <laughs> And I'm changing this tire, you know? I mean, in those days, you physically had to break them down, put the pole in and, you know, take it around and get, change the tire. And I'm changing this tire, and the next thing I know, my dad's belt hits my backside, and I thought, you know, something was going to shoot out the top of my head. And he just looked at me and he said, I don't ever want to hear you disrespect somebody older than you. And just walked off. And that was it. But that's how I learned lessons. You know, my girlfriend, before I mess, met, dated Miss Terry, was Joyce. And um, Joyce, Joyce dumped me. Joyce dumped you? Jo Joyce dumped me. Right? And I'm working <laughs> at my dad's station. And it's a service station. Now you've got to go out and pump the people's gas, get their money, clean their windows, check the oil, all that stuff. And I'm upset, treating the customers bad. So I walk in his office, he's sitting in there, and he said, what happened to you today? And I, and I said, Joyce broke up with me. He said, oh, you don't have a girlfriend now? I said, no. He said, if you don't start treating the customers better, you're not going to have a job. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then he said, as your boss, if I fire you, you're not going to have a job. 
if you get fired as your dad, I'm going to whip your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the lesson was he always taught lessons. He said, and I still tell players that story. Don't let one thing bad happen. Create three, which was the lesson. That's exactly what the lesson was, and that's what he told me. He says, one bad thing happens. Now you, you're, going, you're going to turn it into three bad things. You're not going to have a girlfriend, you're not going to have a job, and you're going to have a sore butt. <laughs> yep. That, man, that's a great life lesson there. <laughs> I, mean, I, I Somehow I picture confetti falling in Pasadena at the national championship and Joyce somewhere watching television going, dang it, I, I dumped him? What did I do? What did I do? What about you, cable splitter? When's the last time? When, when's the last time you got disciplined? Yeah, I, I, all I know. So I was big into basketball. So eventually, I think the last time I got spanked, I laughed at my mom. That didn't go over well. So my dad got home from work and I think broke the spanking stick on me. So then spankings were kind of done because they didn't hurt that much. So then they started figuring out what, like with my kids, you know. We just take away the iPad or the phone. If you take, it, we didn't even take away the oldest one's phone. We just took her off Snapchat for like a week. I thought it was the end of the world. Like so, <laughs> you just figure out what they do and you take it away from them. So with me, we had two colleges and three high schools in town. I tried to go to every basketball game I could. Like I, so they said that's it. You missed three games. So I was like three games. I can't. Like I, I didn't, you know, there's some big games coming up. So I figured out when the. Uh, girls JV at this place and the women's game here and this. I'm like, these are the three games, next three games. These are the ones I'm missing. So I could still make it to the boys varsity game on Friday night when I was like in junior high. So I, I, I kind of manipulated a little bit, but they, they just figured out what I wanted to do the most and took that away from me. So that's what, that's what we got when we got growing up. Well, you know, I, I'm going to clear the air here about discipline because discipline is not really punishment as some people think. The media. Discipline, there's lots of definitions of discipline, but doing what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, the way it's supposed to get done, do the right thing the right way, the right time, all the time. Those are definitions of discipline. But what is self-discipline? You know, we make hundreds of decisions every day that come down to two questions. Here's something I know I'm supposed to do that I really don't want to do. Can you make yourself do it? Over here, there's something you know you're not supposed to do, but you want to do it. Can you keep yourself from it? So if you can make these choices and decisions the right way, you'll be able to make progress, develop the right habits so that you can accomplish the goals that you have. It's feeling versus choice. Are you going to do what you feel like doing, or are you going to choose to do the things you need to do to accomplish the goals that you have? And as soon as the clock goes off in the morning, we start making these decisions. I don't feel like getting up today. I got an 8 o'clock class. I don't feel like going to class. I don't feel like studying. How many times do you hear your kids say, I don't feel like? And you should say, you need to choose to. You need to choose to go to class. You need to choose to study. You need to cho because these things create the right habits, and those habits create the right choices. The choices you make make you who you are. And... Ultimately, you'll have a chance to be successful if you can make those choices and decisions the right way. So discipline is not punishment is my point, all right? Because as soon as one of our players mess up, the first thing you're going to ask me, what are you going to do to them? And then you usually answer with that tone, and it scares me, and I feel like you're disciplining me. Uh, the, the athletes who, who will see this are, are coming to town, and, you know, mental health and mindset – is, is so important. One of the first things that I learned about you when you got to Tuscaloosa was you really believed in the sports psychology what, what, of, of that in your team. When you got to Tuscaloosa back in 2007, how important was it for you to bring in the speakers, to, to have the sports psychologists available, to get a workup on every one of your players so that you could, I feel like you coach every one of them differently. Is that true? Well, I, I learned that in pro sports, though. You know, I think before I went to pro ball as a coach, I coached every player the same. Same demand, same command, treated them the same, got after them the same. Everybody didn't respond the same. 
And everybody couldn't do the same things equally as well based on their skill set. But the guys that could do the things the way I wanted them to do it or the way I taught them, and I taught them all the same, they're the guys that got to play. So when you go to pro ball and the owner pays a guy, he's playing. So whether he can backpedal the way you coach him to backpedal, like I had Menafield and Walls at the same time, two corners in Cleveland. Menafield was short, quick, fast, great feet, could backpedal, could do everything. Walls was like 6'3", weighed 200 pounds, probably couldn't run 4'7", wind dated. I couldn't backpedal, but he was still, I think, has the most intercepts of anybody ever played in the NFL, defensive back. So the owner pays the guy. You've got to be able to coach the guy psychologically and physically the way he can play because he's going to play. The owner doesn't give a guy a $10 million signing bonus and – Watch him sit on the bench. So I learned in professional football how to treat every player a little different to try to get the best out of them relative to their personality and also the different skill sets that you had. So you learn how to coach different physical skill sets different ways so that they could succeed uh, for themselves because that was, in, that was an important thing to do because they were going to play. So um, when I got back to college, then I started to do the same thing. We started with sports psychiatrist. Um, met Dr. Rosen. You've heard me talk about him before. Uh, he's been with me for like 25 years. Human behavior is a really critical thing in bringing out the best in people and knowing how to bring the best in people. And that's not something I'm expert in, but through other people's help and input, it's helped us get through to a lot more players. I've tried to go 30 minutes and not ask about name, image, and likeness because that's talked about every day. But we have, you know, the most successful people in Birmingham in the room here. Um, it seems like Alabama, the University of Alabama, has taken a different approach than some schools. Uh, very, almost like you guys are prepared to run a marathon and everyone else is doing a sprint with name, image, and likeness. Nate, I'll start with you. If, if these people are eager to help or, you know, or, or, you with name, image, and likeness, how, how do you feel about the way Alabama's attacking that right now? And for people that want to help, or how, how are you approaching name, image, and likeness with your program? Yeah, I mean, it's all new. So we, we've kind of figured it out on the fly. I think the university's done a pretty good job. I, we haven't been out in front advertising a bunch of, you're still not supposed to be able to use it for recruiting. I think there's people out there committing some violations that maybe you're going to get in trouble, and we haven't done that. I think they've done a good job, but we – it's here, it's a reality, and if kids in Alabama aren't able to profit off their name, image, and likeness like they are at some other schools, it's gonna hurt us in recruiting and everything. It's just a fact of the matter. So, you know, we, we've got some people that have been very supportive. We need to get more people that are gonna support the whole concept of name, image, and likeness. It's not something we necessarily wanted to turn into this kind of turn into a wild, wild west in some areas. I think they got to get under control, but but we it's here. It's not going to go away. They're not going to tell a kid he can't profit off his name, image, and likeness. Maybe they can get some of the collectives and stuff's a little more under control, but, you know, if, if we can have some people really get behind some of the athletes and some of the teams and able to support them, and we're going to have to in order to stay up. That's just the reality of it. It's here. It's not going to change a whole lot. They may be able to get some of the stuff under control, but it, it's it's a reality we've got to face. And we're in recruiting now, and kids ask us about it. We're not not allowed to promise the kid X amount of anything to come here, but they want to know what current kids got, what kids last year got, what, what's going to happen on the roster. And if you don't have pretty good answers for them, you're going to have a hard time recruiting a good roster not in, with, in today's market with the way it is. Well, you know, name, image, and likeness to me is a great concept for players. Um, players have always been allowed to work. Uh, this is just a different opportunity for them to make money by working and using their own name, image, and likeness, whether it's signing autographs, whether it's doing commercials or ads for some company or whatever. So there's nothing wrong with that. And I told our players when this whole thing started to get agents, get representation, um, and so you create opportunities for yourself. And our players last year created $3 million worth of opportunity for themselves by doing it the right way. And I have no problem with that. And nobody had a problem on our team with that.
because the guys that got the money earned it. Now, there were only 25 guys on our team that had the opportunity to earn money. The issue and the problem with name, image, and likeness is coaches trying to create an advantage for themselves I right, went out and said, okay, how could we use this to our advantage? They created what's called a collective. All right, a collective is an outside marketing agency uh, that's not tied to the university, that's funded by alumni from the university. And they give this collective millions of dollars. And that marketing agency then funnels it to the players. Uh, and the coach actually pr knows how much money's in the collective, so he knows how much he can promise every player. That's not what name, image, and likeness was supposed to be. That's what it's become, and that's the problem in college athletics right now. And now every player is saying, well, what am I going to get? Well, my philosophy is my job is to create a platform for our players to create value for themselves and their future by becoming better people, uh, by graduating from school and developing a career off the field, and by seeing if they can develop a career on the field and play at the next level in the NFL. Our players have made $1.7 billion in the NFL since 2010. All right, so wow. we've created a lot of opportunity. We also have one of the highest graduation rates, you know, in college athletics. We have the most guys that graduate inside of four years. So we've done a good job of that. But now in recruiting, we have players in our state that grew up wanting to come to Alabama that they won't commit to us unless we say we're going to give them what somebody else is going to give them. And my theory on that is everything that we've done in college athletics has always been equal. Your scholarship is equal. They get equal Austin, Austin money. They get equal uh, cost of attendance. Uh, they get equal academic support. They get equal medical attention, everything has always been equal. So I told our players, I said, we're going to have a collective, but everybody's going to get the same amount of opportunity from that collective. Now, you can go earn however much you want. And I tell the recruits the same thing, because our job is not to buy you to come to school here. And I don't know how you manage your locker room, and I don't know if this is a sustainable model, uh, because one of you folks are going to give some player that comes to our school a bunch of money to come to our school. And then you're going to come to the game in full strut, I think, and I'm going to tell everybody I got that guy to come to Alabama. And then he's not going to play, and he's going to transfer, and you're going to say, I'm never going to do this again. All right, so I don't know how it works. I don't, I don't know how you sustain a model like that. Now, I know that we're going to lose recruits because somebody else is going to be willing to pay them more. Um, but name, image, and likeness is something that's here. And I think the more supporters that we have for the University of Alabama in all sports right, that are willing to sponsor players, whatever you want to call it, use them in your business to help your business, that's going to help our programs. Um, the thing that I fear is at some point in time, they're just going to say we're going to have to pay players. If we start paying players, we're going to have to eliminate sports. All right, and this is, this is all bad for college sports. I mean, we probably have, what, 450 people on scholarship at Alabama, whether they're women's tennis players, women's softball players, golfers, you know, baseball players, non-revenue sports that, should, that have for years and years and years been able to create a better life for themselves because they've been able to get scholarships and participate in college athletics. That's what college athletics is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be something where people come and make money. And you make a decision about where you go to school based on how much money you're going to make. You should make a decision based on where you have the best chance to develop as a person, as a student, and as a player, which is what we've always tried to major in. And we're going to continue to do that. And hopefully there's enough people out there that are want to do it. But I know the consequence is going to be difficult for the people who are spending tons of money to get players. And you've read about them. You know who they are. I mean, we were second in recruiting last year. A&M was first. A&M bought every player on their team, made a deal for name, image, and likeness. All right, we didn't buy one player. All right, but I don't know if we're going to be able to sustain that in the future because more and more people are doing it. Yeah. So it's, um, it's tough, and people blame the NCAA. But in defense of the NCAA, we are where we are 
all right, because of the litigation that the NCAA gets, like the transfer portal. Every time somebody wanted to transfer, they'd apply for a waiver. All right, if you didn't give them, if the NCAA didn't give them a waiver so they could be immediately eligible, they filed suit. So the NCAA would back off and give them a waiver. So they just said, we're just going to make a rule where everybody can transfer. That's how that happened. So if the NCAA doesn't get some protection from litigation, whether we got to get an antitrust or whatever it is, from a federal government standpoint, this is not going to change because they cannot enforce their rules, just like Nate said. We have a rule right now that says you cannot use name, image, and likeness to entice a player to come to your school. Hell, read about it in the paper. I mean, Jackson State paid a guy a million dollars last year that was a really good Division I player to come to school. It was in the paper, and they bragged about it. Nobody did anything about it. I mean, these guys at Miami that are going to play basketball there for $400,000, it's in the newspaper. The guy tells you how he's doing it. So, um, but the NCAA can't enforce their rules because it's not against the law. And that's an issue. That's a problem. And, and unless we get something that protects them from litigation, I don't know what we're going to do about it. These guys are the, the real deal. I see them at sporting events, like I turned around one night, Nate's at a softball game. Uh, Nick supports all the other sports. He inspires them, talks to them, is at games. Um, and when I was on your radio show this past year, I told you in a commercial break, and, and I saw you do this speech, I think it was back, I think it was 2011 or 2012, where you talked about the powers of the words thank you. And I told you, the commercial break, thank you, because of his success, you know, I don't work for him, but because of his success, my salary has more than doubled in my career. I've been able to fund two kids now, as soon as my uh, son graduates next week, two kids to college because of his success. A lot of pressure on you, Nate. I'd like to double my salary again. <laughs> um, but I, I want to say... Football's where the money's at. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for what you guys do not only for the student athletes at Alabama, football, basketball, but the other sports, but thank you for supporting the World Games. Thank you for being here tonight with us. Um, it's not easy to jump in a car from Tuscaloosa and come over here when you got so much going on. And I know this crowd appreciates your time tonight. So from the bottom of my heart, not just in my wallet, but the bottom of my heart, thank you for what you guys did for, for us tonight. Well, thank you, Jim. But you know, there's another lesson and thank you. You know, when I was nine years old playing Little League Baseball, I played second base because I was the littlest guy on the team and I was the only position I could play and get the ball to first base. And my coach was Jocko Anderson. And he would stay and hit me extra ground balls, you know, at the end because I was the littlest guy. I probably shouldn't have been playing. We just, I must not have had enough guys to make a team. And um, so my dad picked me up from practice and I said, hey coach, Thanks. Thank you for, you know, hitting me extra ground balls. And we're walking to the car, and my dad said, you know, every thank you has an IOU. Somebody did something for you, and you thank them for it. That means you should be looking to do something to help them some kind of way. It has an IOU. He's your coach. You'd respect them. You do what he tells you to do, and you give him your best effort. That's what you owe him because he's trying to help you get better. So that whole concept of every thank you has an IOU is something that we all can remember. And I want to thank you all for the support that you've given us. Uh, you've made Alabama a great place for us to live. Uh, you've helped us have a successful program. Uh, your support and passion has been what has allowed us to get a lot of really, really good players. I know they're enjoyable to watch, uh, but that's why we've had the success, and it all starts with you all who support the program being a part of the team, and I thank you very much for that, and we owe you the best that we can do so you can have a team that you can be proud of. So thank you so much, and roll tide. Everybody, Nate Oates and Nick Saban. Thank you, roll tide.